That's right, humans of 7657. If you can hear this, it can mean only one thing, and that is Lecture 5 is now in the books and ready to go. Uh, quantitative research tools, that is what is on tap for tonight. We're going to take a fairly similar approach to the way that we looked at the last lecture for qualitative research. And uh, we're going to go through a similar process for the quantitative side. So we're going to be looking at numbers today and numerical data. Uh, this lecture also is a somewhat of a milestone for us. Um, after you finish your work for lecture four and five, uh, for the most part, you have all the information that you need in order to not only write section number two, but also to begin collecting data. We still have a little time until that happens, but uh, you will have all the information that, that, you, that you need. Lecture number six, the next one, next one is a little bit different. Uh, you'll see why. I don't want to get into it right now. But um, yeah, this kind of puts a, a little bow tie on, this, uh, on these research tools and designs that we've been talking about. Uh, as far as the picture, you see that young lady in the bottom left-hand corner with the bright pink, seems like a skirt to me or like a little skirt or... I've been saying for years that that was my daughter and she recently saw, saw the picture and said, that is not me. My son took one look at him right in the middle and said, yes, that is me, dad, kind of slowly sinking into the sand. It was fun watching them trying to get up that, that great big giant sand dune only to kind of fall back down. I know, right? <laughs> Father of the year. <laughs> Guys, I hope you enjoyed lecture number five. Uh, have, a, have a great week whenever and wherever you are. And I will catch you in lecture number six in not too much longer. Tonight's specials, we only have three things to do. <laughs> Look at that, just three things. Quantitative tools is going to be priority number one. Last week, or last lecture, I should say, we did a qualitative tools, so tonight we absolutely must focus on quantitative. We've got some numbers tonight. Uh, we are going to look at something called a research calendar creation, which is, uh, is, which is, always, a fun little, uh, which is always a fun little assignment. And then uh, finally, you're going to get the format for section number two, which, which is your methodologies. So that next installment in your, in your thesis will be located right here in, in this lecture. Without further ado, let's get it going. I want to take a quick, quick little look at the design slides from last week. Won't spend more than a couple minutes on uh, on this little section, but I did want to review it just to kind of refresh your memory before we get into the quantitative tool section. So, visual design number one, as we go through some rewind slides, visual design number one is called your pre-test, post-test design, and on the left-hand side, you have your experimental group, which uh, is exposed to the intervention. And then on the other side, you have your control group, which has no in, which has no intervention. Last week, or last lecture, we did two qualitative. Two qualitative. You, you. Well, I gave you four, but you're going to choose two qualitative tools. Well, tonight you're going to get a similar set of tools, except you're going to choose two quantitative tools. The reason that I mention that now is because if you take a look at the bottom and top you'll see your four dependent variables. In other words, your four measures to see whether that intervention was more effective than the no intervention. So this is, again, the pre-test, post-test design. Let's look at the next one. For some of you that did not like the pre-test, post-test design for whatever reason, uh, design number two is going to be your trials or what your textbook calls your time series. And if you look at your time series, you'll notice that there is no control. That's because all you have is intervention after intervention after intervention. And your dependent variables are going to be surrounding those trials. I had said it last time, but I'll say it again here real quick. Uh, to me, the ideal number is four trials. Unfortunately, my slide only held three. So uh, have, that, uh, have that in the back of your mind. So we got... Pre-test, post-test, here we got the time series. Let's do with the last one. I believe I had titled this in, in last uh, lecture as a correlational design, 
meaning that you want to get the correlation between one intervention, like a version of that intervention, and another version of that intervention. And of course, you can't get away from your dependent variables, right? We've got we to gotta measure the success of those interventions. But this will be the, this will be the, the third option or the, or the third choice for you as far as how you want your, of how you want your, your research to unfold. Please remember, as we go forward, your quantitative tools or your qualitative tools from last lecture do not refer to your intervention. Instead, they refer to how you're going to measure the effect of that intervention had on your, on your students. Uh, that's important to remember as we go forward because even though we are talking, we reviewed uh, the different designs of how you would like your research to unfold, as we go forward, the intervention and the tools are two very, very different things, and I want that to kind of be in the forefront of your thinking as we move forward to, to the next couple slides. So, which one did you pick? Was it design number one? Was it the pretest, post test? Was it design number two, the simple time series? Or maybe it was design number three, the correlational. What are the pros and cons of the particular format that you picked for your, for your research? How about qualitative tools? Because remember, you gotta know whether your intervention was effective or not. Did you pick two qualitative tools from last week? The reason that I'm asking you these questions is because a lot of these are kind of like primer questions, meaning that you should be able to, to some degree, effectively answer those questions as you, as you move forward. Now, if you can't answer them because they're not at the tip of your tongue, that's also okay. But at some point, you are going to need to answer them kind of have that in the back of your mind because right now we're going to be taking a look at some quantitative tools. Yay, quantitative methodologies. I think to some degree a lot of what we're going to talk about in the next slide or two uh, is going to be somewhat a, of a review for you in the sense that you've been exposed to the idea of data collection uh, either through undergraduate or through or through work, and uh, you probably remember that quantitative methods of of data collection is based off numerical data. So whereas last week uh, qualitative data is based off experiential data and collecting uh, through the five senses, this is strictly a, a numbers based a numbers based collection. Uh, they are obviously uh, fairly different. Uh, to some degree, but what remains the same is that you're still looking to prove or disprove your hypothesis. I'm going to pause here for just a second because I want you to go back in your head and remember, what is your hypothesis? What are you trying to prove or disprove within your, within your classrooms? So now that you put it in your head there, the tools that you're going to prove that you're going to use to prove or disprove are going to be different between qualitative and quantitative, but the goal remains the same, and it very much is, I like that word, welded to your hypothesis. Can't get away from those three things, can we? Academics, behavior, and attitude. As you collect your data, both qualitative and quantitative, you're going to be collecting data that surrounds academics, behaviors, and, and attitudes. Start thinking here. Start thinking here. Ready? What type of data collection, let's do quantitative, numerical, can you use as a teacher in order to measure academics? No, that's like a real question. Okay. How about behaviors? Is there any data collection that you could use to measure behaviors or an attitude? Of course, the answer to all those questions is yes, there are. Obviously, it's going to be more specific to you. However, those three, those three ideas, those three concepts very much will determine what, what your data collection tools will look like. 
Speaking of data collection tools, let's take a look at a few of them. Quantitative tools, here we go. Please be mindful of the fact that the next few slides are going to be all about choices. Choices about different tools that you could be using. Uh, my list here in this lecture is uh, definitely not an exhaustive list, uh, but it probably it probably covers the the vast majority of different tools that that you could typically use as a as a uh, as a researcher. Obviously, in the text and online resources, we'll have more features and, and different types of information. But in the end, tonight and especially in this little part of uh, of the lecture, is all about different choices. Remember. You need two qualitative tools last time and then two quantitative tools right now. So the first tool that I like to examine really quickly and very much centers around at the top there achievement is uh, something called a, a teacher a teacher made test and a teacher made test for for lack of a, for lack of a better official definition is something that you as a teacher uh, have created in order to measure some sort of academic or achievement gains. Now, I very much like this tool for, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, for, the, for me as a teacher, uh, I, like this, I like this tool because it very much fits into what I do in the classroom anyway. Uh, I'm usually giving at least a few assessments a, a week uh, probably more formative assessments than than summative assessments, but that teacher made test very much gets translated into any content area. Uh, you could use it uh, throughout the course of throughout the course of the day uh, to measure a lot of different a lot of different aspects of the students uh, of the students learning. And I would say uh, from a research perspective, I would say maybe about 80% of, of researchers in, in your position will choose a, some form or some variant of a teacher made test in order to collect quantitative in order to collect quantitative data. If you look at that third bullet point, something that I don't want to forget to mention here is the, also the fact that a teacher made test when looking at achievement is flexible enough to use in any one of those three designs that we spoke about last week and at the beginning of this lecture. So, as an example, if you want to use it as a pretest and a post test, you could start thinking already and seeing it. One of those dependent variables can very well be a teacher made test. That's the choice that you'll that you'll have to make. If you're doing a time series or a correlational. You could also use it as a repeated measure throughout the course of your throughout the course of your your research sequence. Uh, one last thing at the very very bottom there, and that is uh, also that teacher made tests uh, can be fairly creative in the sense that they don't only have to have a single characteristic. Instead, you can put them into just about any format that you have. For example, multiple choice, short answer. Uh, I know. Uh, Typically, in the spring, as we get into a testing season, you'll have the um, you'll have the idea of of writing uh, of writing ELA of writing ELA essays. Whatever it is, you can kind of bring that into your into your teacher made test. So you do get a lot of options and a lot of bang for buck uh, when looking at teacher made tests. Got one more slide here. One of the questions I get asked uh, pretty frequently with uh, with teacher made tests is, um, you know, Perez, can we use uh, can we use a textbook questions or you know the online, you know the online assessments of a particular unit, especially if you get into science and social studies and math, uh, you do get a lot of those uh, those tests that are already pre made for you. Can we use them for for this particular setting and in, in this particular setting? And the answer is a resounding yes. You absolutely can. So, for example, at the end of a unit, or I should let, let me set this up a little bit differently. Let's say now you're you're performing your research, you're delivering your intervention. Let's say in a, in a in a series of science lessons, 
and the textbook gives you those teacher made those teacher made test questions that you could uh, that you could be using. Yeah, absolutely. You could certainly use them not only for your lessons in school, you know, kind of like that Friday assessment, you know, last period, you kind of want to cruise into the uh, cruise into the weekend a little bit. So you give them that little that little teacher made that little teacher made test at the end of it. By all means, also use them for <clears throat> also use them for for your for your research. Another option that a lot of teachers tend to tend to explore is that if you have if you have tests from several different sources, uh, you can certainly combine them into into a single into a single measure. So you know if you want to use you know what the book offers, but you also want to use what a, what a website also has brought in. You know in order to make I don't know let's say ten questions. You know five and five. Absolutely. It's a great idea to kind of begin to combine and mix and match and get a perhaps a more accurate assessment of, uh, of the student's progress throughout the course of, uh, of not only the, the lessons, you know, kind of your DOE lessons, but also your research. So a little more flexibility for you there. Part of measuring achievement in your, in your classrooms is not only the, the teacher made test, but it could also very well be something called a standardized examination. And I know as, uh, as teachers, we've, I guess to some degree, been programmed that a standardized examination, uh, you know, let's say in high school would be a, a regents uh, exam. In elementary school, it might be the ELA, the spring ELA in math uh, examinations, or uh, in science, the fourth and eighth grade uh, the fourth and eighth grade baseline exams. So even though those are a part of uh, a part of it, you know, it's not only the state tests that you could use as standardized examinations. Uh, for me, for example, if I ever wanted to measure something with reading or reading fluency or the ability to read, uh, let's say now your intervention very much wanted to find out whether, you know, whether the reading, whether the reading scores would increase or not. Things like the the running record, uh, you know, very much are are a great are a great tool. For those of you that are that are not familiar with the running record, it's a it's a standardized test that allows you to get an accurate score of a student's ability to decode uh, certain levels of um, certain levels of of writing. Uh, we call them. Some of you may have heard of it called the Fountas and Pinnell reading levels. In upper grades, and certainly once you get into, into high school, you have something called a, a Lexile level. So all these, all these different types of tools can certainly be, can certainly be used uh, as part of your, your achievement test, uh, not just that, that teacher-made test as well. Uh, one last note here, uh, second bullet point there at the very, very bottom. Sorry about that. Um, second bullet point there at the uh, at the very very uh, at, uh, on the bottom set there. Uh, if you have any practice or baseline examinations leading up to uh, math or ELA assessments, uh, those could also very much be considered standardized tests. To some degree, I look at it as just another kind of quasi teacher made test. Uh, but I wanted to give you this slide in order to give you some more ideas of different types of measures that you could possibly pull into your research should the need arise. One last little note here on achievement measures, and I, and I know I said the, the first bullet point uh, earlier, but I'll say it again real quick here, and that is if, um, if you are able to some degree to get these achievement measures uh, that you're going to be doing for your thesis and bring them into your school routines and your classroom routines, whether they are in person or virtual. Uh, by all means, uh, that is a uh, that is a great way of getting ahead in this uh, in this little game that we got going on. Uh, also, I know I know a lot of you uh, travel in cohorts, so you do talk to each other a lot, and that's that's actually you know kind of a Kind of the one thing that I miss about in person is that is that the the cohorts were fun to work with in groups, 
Uh, but in this case, because the measures are very individualized and they very much are a classroom to classroom based uh, measure, uh, if you do speak to each other, those measures don't always necessarily line up between, uh, between the different classrooms. So certainly something to be mindful of. Okay, that puts an end to the idea of achievement measures to some degree. Uh, let's talk about some attitudes. When you think about it, to some degree, achievement is only one part of a student's growth and development that teachers look to, look to measure. And this is especially true as not just teachers, but also as researchers in, in this case. So an attitude, and when we look to measure an attitude, what we're essentially looking for is how a individual responded to a particular stimuli. In this case, the response that we're looking for is, what is the student's attitude towards the intervention that you've presented to them as part of your, as part of your research? Uh, there's a lot of different attitudes that you could, that you could explore, and it, it could get quite creative as to what you're looking for from your, from your students. Some of the basic ones are written right there at the bottom. For example, uh, we'll take just like a really easy one, the first one, and that is enjoyment. How did the students enjoy your particular intervention lessons as opposed to the control lessons? Um, how about effectiveness? Did the students think that your intervention lessons were, were particularly effective? Well, these are all questions that your attitude measure hopes to, hopes to achieve. Um, it doesn't always necessarily have to be enjoyment or effectiveness. It could also be about themselves. Uh, there will be a segment of, of, uh, of the class that, that does want to measure a student's, uh, a, a student's self, self perception based off, the, based off the intervention that you've presented to them. It could be literally any feeling that you think will, ready? that will support your hypothesis to prove or disprove your hypothesis based off those based off those feelings let's build on this a little bit let me go to the next slide one of the easiest and most effective ways of measuring a attitude within a group of individuals is going to be something called a liker type survey and a liker type survey basically takes a particular response, okay, a particular feeling that they're responding to, and it's going to now assign a numerical value to the answer to that question. And in every regard, what it's essentially doing is it's quantifying that response. It's giving, it's giving it a, a value so that you could later take that value and, and begin to manipulate the data that comes from from quantifying that that re, that response. I do have some examples for you later on, but before we move on, a couple of quick things here. Uh, the idea of a survey. If you remember back to to the last lecture with the with the qualitative questionnaire, uh, don't get those two confused. A qualitative questionnaire is basically like a written interview. Uh, which will have some sort of short responses. It's going to be word-based, whereas the survey, the Liker type survey, is going to have a purely numerical response. There will be no words here. It'll be put on a, in a, on a scale, which I'll show you in, in just a second. Uh, as far as your writing for section number two of your, of your thesis, if you look in red there, uh, what I did was I... I I use the language that you should be using in your in your methodology section. So Likert type scale is the right way of saying it. And yes, Likert is capital because there was some dude at some point in history named Mr. Likert or Dr. Likert uh, that developed this type of uh, that this type of scale. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, a couple of examples to highlight this. So our first example is a little bit of a facetious example, but it does provide the, the basics for, for what I'm looking to get at here. 
So we'll start at the top here. How do you feel about Perez's lecture? One, watching grass grow is more exciting. Two, I'd rather be watching an infomercial for two hours. Three, hmm, meh. Or four, this class has fundamentally changed my life. Okay, so look at the, look at the numbers at the, at the very, very bottom. I am looking to measure your attitude towards my lecture. So I give you this particular question, right? And I give this question to everybody in the class. Let's say now there's a class of, of 20. And everyone in that class answers the first one. Watching grass grow is more exciting. Therefore, at the very, very bottom, the lowest possible score, okay, the lowest possible attitude that is stemming from this particular question is going to be a 20. Do you see how it just quantified that particular attitude? How about the other end, which I'm sure applies to everyone in this class? This class has fundamentally changed my life. So I give that question out to 20 people and 20 participants answer with a four. The best attitude that I have that I can score is going, now going to be an 80. See how it takes your feelings and now begins to assign a numerical value to it. Okay, let's take a look at a more traditional view of, of this. And by the way, man, if I were to give this, if I were to give this out to you guys, you better answer four, seriously. So here we have a more traditional view. And once you see it, you'll say to yourself, hey, I've taken this type of survey. And we all have, you know, at the end of a professional development, it's 320, you want to go home, and the presenter gives you one of these surveys, and you just go strongly agree, 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 all the way down. So even though it's a different view than the, than the, one, than the one on the previous slide, which was kind of more of a joke, they're actually asking the same thing when you, when you, when you look at the questions on the, uh, on the left there. Did you find value in the class experience? Did you look forward to coming to class on Wednesday? Or would you take the class again? You see how those, those questions are, are essentially asking the same thing? And then at the very, very top, you have the one, two, three, and four, which is going to act as the quantifier for, for, your, for your survey. A couple of things here as we, as we move forward with this. The, the very, very top where, where the one, two, and three are, you can actually label those whatever you want. They could literally say anything that you want to say as long as you, the researcher, know that that answer is a one and that answer is a two and that answer is a three and then that answer is, is, a, uh, is a four. Um, it's kind of a nice feature to a, to a survey is that you can make the top, the responses in a way, uh, as complex or as rudimentary as they need to be. I remember a couple years ago, um, I had a uh, I had a researcher in the class, and she dealt mostly with nonverbal students that were on the autistic spectrum (ASD), and, and because they were nonverbal and they were non-readers, uh, they weren't able to do strongly agree or strongly disagree. So she had a smiley face, a sad face, and a medium face. And I thought that was a kind of a neat way of expressing the, the answers to the questions that were, were all the way on the, on the left-hand side. Uh, there's really no end to, to what you can accomplish or what you could dive into uh, when looking at these, uh, at these, attitudinal, these attitudinal surveys. Uh, questions I get asked most frequently is, Perez, how many questions do I need? And the answer is as many as you need in order to get the information. If you, if you force me into an answer, I would say 10 is a good number. The number, the number of questions, uh, 10 is a, is a good number. Uh, I like 10 because it's going to produce quite a bit of data for, for, for you. And when I say produce data, I don't mean it's going to make more work for you. No, it's going to create more numbers, which will make your, your life later on easier. It's hard to write when you don't have 
abundant data. If you can come up with 10 questions and you could give those 10 questions to your class, it's a good bit of data that you can kind of work with. Uh, one last little piece before I press enter and change the slide. At the very top, I chose four different responses. You could choose basically as many as you want. The only thing that I would not do is choose an odd number. And the reason why I wouldn't choose an odd number is because what it will essentially do is create a middle column. And that middle column is kind of like deadly for, for the survey because it doesn't mean strongly and it doesn't mean you know, it doesn't mean agree and it doesn't mean disagree it means nothing so i do tend to stay away from that from that odd number and keep it at an even number that way it forces the the respondent to choose a one side of the fence i have one last slide regarding this attitudinal survey and uh, this slide is going to focus on when are you actually going to deliver the survey to your to your students and the idea or one of the one of the ideas leading up to this is the fact that you have to have some sort of comparative group uh, regarding this uh, this survey meaning that you need to understand you need to you need to know not understand you need to know what their attitude was at one point and then compare it to the attitude of, of another point in your, in, your, in your research sequence. So take a look at the bottom there real quick. If you notice, uh, you have th basically three different choices of when you could give this attitude survey to, to, your, to your students. The, the first one is uh, before your intervention, pre, and then after your intervention, post. Think about it for a second. Pre-intervention, right? Meaning, I want to know what their attitude is before they get going on what it is that I want to give to them. And then, what is their attitude afterwards? So, I'm taking a baseline and then I'm taking a post-test in order to understand how much growth in their attitude did I see. This one very much goes hand in hand with design number one, pre and post test. It doesn't only have to go with that one, but it very much lends itself to that one. Look at the second one. Let's say, for example, though, let's say, for example, now I want to do at the end of the intervention and I don't know, at the end of the control. That would be a post post. What you'll notice, though, is that it always has a comparison, whether it's pre-post or post-post or even the last one, where you're periodically giving that attitudinal survey uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the, the intervention process or throughout the research process. You're always kind of creating a, a comparative group, so I have that back and forth on which to write on later on in your, in your thesis. Um, by the way, the choices are completely up to you. It, it honestly doesn't necessarily matter when you give it as long as you have some sort of comparison. Uh, one last little piece before we put the, uh, the attitudinal uh, survey to bed here. Uh, you actually can give the same exact attitudinal survey every time that you give it. So whereas a teacher may test, you probably had to vary it a little bit between pre and post or, you know, between the different, um, the different times that you're giving it. For an attitudinal survey, it could be the exact same, the exact same survey because remember, you're measuring the stimuli. So even though the survey is the same, the stimuli or when they're exposed to it is just a little bit different, but that creates the comparison that you need in order to have that, uh, that back and forth. That is it on the attitude. Let's move on to the next one here. Quick recap here. We started with the teacher made test to measure achievement. Then we looked at some options for standardized examinations as a measurement tool. We did uh, the attitudinal survey as a, uh, as a way to quantify 
a particular feeling that your students may have. And finally, we come to the last one. Your option number four is going to be the, the rubric. And we've all, at this point, you know, if you're teaching the DOE for about 10 minutes, you've been exposed to, to some, sort of, some sort of rubric. Uh, I don't know about your schools, but my school loves rubric. I probably get a dozen every single semester uh, for, different, for different areas, for different topics. Uh, I feel like every book uh, that I open or every, uh, every spiral-bound curriculum that I, that I go through always seems to have a rubric somewhere, somewhere in there. So we kind of know what they are. As far as your research world and your research life, what a rubric is going to do for you is it's going to it's going to take a particular set of a particular set of criteria, and then by nature it's going to quantify that that criteria. Um, what's really nice about about a rubric is you can you could put a rubric to anything, you know you can measure rubric against anything. Uh, Probably the most common, the most common use of a rubric in at least at least in my school, is uh, for a particular writing piece. You know, if a kid's doing a, an essay or some sort of writing writing sample, uh, we would use a rubric in order to in order to grade that that writing sample. But when you think about it, you could put a rubric to to just about any part of your your academic day. Uh, I've even seen you know rubrics used for for behaviors. Uh, for identifying specific type of behaviors and kind of quantifying what different behaviors might might actually look like, so uh, a rubric would be would be a very viable option for your quanti for as a quantitative uh, as your quantitative tool. Uh, also, that last that last or third bullet point there, uh, schools should have a a ton of rubrics and there's a ton of rubrics on on the internet. So the, if you do choose to use a rubric, no one should be making their own rubric at this point. It's very time consuming and uh, there's really no reason to, to do that. Find an existing one, find a rubric that matches what it is that you want to measure uh, and then go ahead and, and, and use that for your, uh, for your students in order to measure that, that growth. Those are your four choices. How many of you guys picking, you remember? Good job, you're picking two. Picking two quantitative, and then we go back to last lecture, you're gonna pick two qualitative, and that is going to equal your four dependent variables which you're going to use to measure the effectiveness of your intervention. Uh, I have a try it now, and then we're gonna change gears to something a little bit different. Little try it now, just at the end of this little sequence. Uh, if you do need to, uh, if you do need some support, this would be a great place to hit pause and give it a shot. Also, this try it now and these particular questions, I I wrote them, I wrote them like actually right now before I um, before I started talking. Um, I wrote them with the with the intention and kind of in the back of my mind that this will also very much uh, line up with your methodology section, your, your, section number, your section number two of your, of your thesis. In other words, if you could answer these questions to, to some degree, it will take your, your thinking a little further down the road when it comes to actually putting pen to paper with your, with your methodology section. And, and again, we, I do have that format coming up in, in a couple slides. Got one thing to do before that, but we will get to it. Um, if you ask me, which one do I like the best? Let me see. So I like the second one, you know. I like I, I like the idea of as you're designing your measurements, that your qualitative and your quantitative kind of mesh together. And that kind of goes with with the, the third one there. You know, are you measuring different things within your within your intervention lessons, um, so that you're not just doing the same thing over and over again? Meaning that all four dependent variables are all measuring academics, or they're all measuring behavior. Uh, you're you're probably going to want to to mix and match to some degree, and you know, choose choose two out of the three. If nothing else, just to keep yourself engaged. You know that you're. You know, you're not just hitting one of those uh, one of those aspects kind of over over and over again. Uh, and of course, then the last one, I can't emphasize that enough. 
two birds, one stone. You, you use it for the classroom, you use it for your thesis. Um, change gears, but before we do, I'm going to call it a night. <laughs> You're going to change gears. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my feet up for, uh, for a little while. Um, I will catch you on the next slide. Good night. I'm such a sucker, you know that? I sat down, I opened up a YouTube, I went to my uh, my subscriber page and it was like, no one posted a video today. So I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? So let me get back to lecturing. Let me do something productive. So here we are again, creating a research calendar. <laughs> so let's do a quick uh, visualization here. And the visualization is as follows. You're, you're, you have, your, you have your, your research all set up. You have your four weeks of research kind of set up, ready to go. You have whatever research design or format you've thought of, you know, one, two, or three. You have your four dependent variables, your four measurement tools. So everything is kind of in place here, right? Now, one of the easiest things, one of the easiest things that could and sometimes does go wrong is that as you begin to deliver these these research actions right in red right in the middle there right as you as you begin to deliver these research actions and and do certain things regarding your research it's very easy to kind of get lost and one of the things that i found that really remedies this is uh, the idea of a, of a calendar creation uh, i guess to some degree it's almost like a like a lesson plan format uh, I do have a couple models for you on, on the next couple slides. So it's not really a lesson plan in the sense that you're not really writing, you know, as much as you would uh, for, for a typical lesson plan. But it does have that, that very sequential nature, and it's a very easy way to kind of keep track of the things that you're going to be doing in your, in your research world. Let's take a quick look at, at two different models here. Well, when I said calendar creation, I really meant it's an actual calendar, right? Uh, in in this particular in this particular model, I'm going to ask you a quick question here. Which one of the research designs does this go to? I'll even give you multiple choice, right? Pretest, post test, number one. Time series two, or correlational three. Which one is demonstrated here? Good job, buddy. Number one, pre-test, post-test design. Take a look. You got your control lessons the first two weeks. Then you got your intervention, your IV lessons the next two weeks. Nice, little, succinct, and neat little research periods. There are a total of four weeks here. And if you notice, uh, if you notice carefully, every action that I'm going to take as a researcher is now kind of being put into this research calendar. I almost like wanted to be a deposit, a, a, a depository for, for what it is I need to do. So I no longer need to keep these things kind of floating around in the, in the back of my mind. Um, even if you just take a look at, let's say April 9th, right? I, I think, I think that's just kind of a random day, but it, it might more or less match when you do yours. Um, I know right away that the first, the first day, I'm going to have some sort of pretest. Don't know yet what that pretest is because remember this calendar is very generic. But the idea that I have to deliver a pretest to to those students at the beginning of the of the week, at the beginning of my control lessons, that's going to take place on that first research day. I, I give three control lessons. We spoke about what the what that kind of means as far as the fact that it's typical instruction. And then take a look at the Friday, Friday, the 9, 10, 11, 12, the, the, yeah, I should have gone the other way, the 13th. I know that at the end of the week, I'm going to have to give some sort of post-test, right? Because the pre-test and the post-test has to, has, to kind of, uh, has to kind of bracket each other. And I also have scheduled on Friday some sort of qualitative um, measure. It could be an interview, it could be the questionnaire, whatever, whatever it is that, that I've decided. Um, if you drop down to the 16th, I made a little note for myself, need to photocopy TMT, teacher may test. So I got to do that, right? Because I'm giving another pretest. Uh, if you go to the 20th, I'm giving an attitude survey along with that post test. 
and so on and so on and so forth, okay? Um, I write little notes for myself, as you can see on the, on the 31st, if it's a 31 month. Uh, see if the scope and sequence for tie-in, you know, let me see if that, that intervention lesson could be tied in with something that I'm doing in, the, in, in the, my classroom curriculum. So you can see there's a lot of good information here. Uh, another thing I'll point out, take a look at how my control lessons and my IV lessons are not given every single day of the week. The way that I personally like to do my research is I like to make the middle of the week my lessons, whether it's their IV or control, and I like to make the ends, uh, leave them open for, for my DVs, for my dependent variables, my, my measurement tools. You don't have to do it that way, but it is a uh, it is a strategy that has worked for me. So that was the the control the control intervention lessons pretest post test there thing. Let's go to a second one. So I'm gonna let that sit for a second while I take a little sip of tea. So which one is it? Obviously, it can't be the first one because we just did that one. Yeah, there you go. Trial one, trial two, trial three, trial four. This would be a time series. As you can see, the actions did not change. I, all I did was take it from the top and put it in the bottom. So my actions are fairly similar, but the design is different, right? So you have that trial one, trial two, trial three. Again, this is a four-week four study. Uh, I made sure that all my pretests were bracketed with post tests. I made sure that my survey had an initial and had a and had a, a matching one at the uh, at the end there. So everything is exactly the same. The only difference is obviously there's no control here because in your in your design number two, you have that repeated intervention and you kind of taking your data over over time. Um, this is another example of, uh, you know, the calendar of something that I'm not collecting, that I'm not going to see, but it's best practices. And I, and I, and I got to tell you, I'm sure I've said it before, but I'll say it again. If you could organize yourself and actually get this done the way that it's supposed to be done, it's actually a lot easier than doing it in any, uh, in any other way. Uh, definitely give this a shot. It's really easy to make. I mean, it, it took me it took me a couple minutes, you know, to get this uh, to get this, you know, put together. Uh, another little bit of advice here before I, I turn the page is you may actually want to write your your methodology section. You may actually want to write your section two, and then take a look at and then kind of complete this. I, I think uh, I think actually that's. That's actually really good advice. It would make it a lot easier. But I'm sure there, there'll be some of you that would like to put it into a calendar first and then take it into your methodology. Okay, this time I, I am really uh, quitting for the evening. I will see you in the next one. We're going to be looking at, um, at the methodology section. We're going to be doing that format thing again. And uh, hopefully we can wrap up lecture number five by, uh, by tomorrow. Uh, good night, guys, by the way. It's funny, every time we start a new format section, in this case, methodology, so every time we start a new format section, I think to myself, okay, here we go, one more down. So here we go, one more down. We will absolutely get into some page numbers and get into some more specifics on the next couple of slides. But for now, let's talk a little bit about the purpose of a methodology. In this case, your section number two of your thesis paper. So it, you, your, your research, right, which we've been talking about, uh, the design of your research the past couple of lectures, uh, there, there has to be some sort of roadmap that you have to be able to create um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, first and foremost, for yourself, you know, you have to have that roadmap that's going to indicate to you and the researcher, look, these are some of the steps that I'm going to be taking uh, as far as my intervention, as far as my my measuring tools. Uh, it also serves the purpose for me as, a, uh, as an evaluator of your work uh, to be able to say, you know what, uh, I see what you want to do and I see where you want to go with it. I think this might be a little bit better. I think this might work. 
uh, a little bit differently for you. So it, it almost like gives us a platform um, in which to, to make that, that sequence just a little bit more uh, efficient and maybe even a little bit more effective. Um, classically, uh, last bullet point there, classically, uh, when, when a researcher would write their methodology, it was for the purpose that if someone else did want to recreate the study or was interested in the results of the study, they would be able to go back and look at the, the methodologies that were instituted to see if, how they matched up and maybe even to kind of begin to continue uh, the research process themselves. Uh, as, far as, uh, as far as your continued education, I know most of you will will stop at your master's but there will be a percentage of you that that will go on into more advanced degrees uh i think the number is up to i want to say 27. i think the number is 27 meaning 27 students that have taken the research class with me that have gone on to to uh at least begin their doctoral studies i don't know if they completed it or not but um i i think the number is 27 and I'm sure some percentage of that 27 students used their methodology from, from their master's thesis, this one right here, uh, in order to propel themselves into that, next, um, into that next level of education. So even though that may not apply to you, it is uh, certainly, a part of the, uh, uh, certainly a part of the purpose. So let's get into some specifics, right? We're going to go subheading to subheading. But in the back of your mind, just know that the purpose is going to be to talk about the methods that you're going to take in order to deliver your research. So subheading number one is going to be uh, something that you're probably going to become very familiar with throughout your the different sections of your of your thesis. That's because each section carries its own its own little mini introduction. If you look at the very very bottom there, I give you uh, some general page page numbers just to kind of give you a guideline. Uh, you probably remember from from the, your section number one writing. So in this case, uh, the introduction is going to be a restatement of of the problem that you focused on. Uh, you're going to provide a, some general information, four sentences, five sentences max. Um, the, the, real, the real purpose of, a, of, a, of, a, of an introduction for each one of your, your, your new sections is that, you know, a lot of times with, with these large research articles, because that's essentially what you're writing is, is, a, is a large article, which we call thesis. Um, readers are not necessarily going to read all 20, 30 pages, or whatever, whatever you have written. Um, what they might actually do, though, is they may open up just one part of it and, and kind of look at that. So you want to give that reader uh, a general gist or a general idea of, of what it is that you're covering um, as, as, part of, uh, as part of what they're, what they're going to read. Uh, again, it's really easy, really, really quick, one paragraph long. Don't, don't get lost in, in, that, uh, in that subheading. All right, now that you got the introduction out of the way, quick little paragraph. We're going to get into what I consider to be the kind of like the meat of the, um, of the, of the section. Um, and that's going to come under the title of procedure, right? Procedural writing. And in this, particular, in this particular heading at the very, very top, I have that it's going to be subheading two and three. So I want to tell you something real quick here, but we'll get into it in the next three or four slides. Your procedure will look different if you chose, depending on which research design you've chosen for yourself. Let me get very specific here. Let's say, for example, you chose uh, control intervention, right? Pre-test, post-test, we call it design number one uh, at, uh, last, last, uh, last lecture. That, though, that procedural writing is going to look differently than if you chose design two or three, which is the time series designs. So bear that in mind as you go forward. Uh, we're going to cover both, but depending on which ones you've chosen, uh, that's the way that your format will, will look. And they will look differently from each other. But for now, let's just talk about procedures, procedural writing like in general, so you have an idea of what's going to go into, 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 this, particular, into this particular subheading. Uh, I'm going to looking at bullet point number two there, and I like a, a couple of words that I think may clarify what it is that we're looking for. The first word is, uh, it's an accounting. Uh, some of the major steps that you're going to be taking in order to accomplish or in order to 
unfold your research within your within your classrooms. The details that are going to go into it are are going to kind of fill in the gaps between some of those uh, some of those major some of those major steps. For those of you that have taught ELA specifically writing, we always teach how to how to do something right. If you're in first grade, second grade, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you know kids write to that. Well, this is fairly similar to that in the sense that you're not making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but you are you are trying to put together a a research a research a set of a set of research tasks uh, that you're that you hope to give to your students at some point. The, the these procedures chronologically are are going to be something that that you have to include uh, within your within your your thesis. Um, for those of you that 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 will be that will be that will be doing that will be doing the pretest post test that very bottom bullet point you're going to be focused mainly on your on your intervention uh, we'll, we'll get more to that on the on the next slide but for now take away with you from this slide the idea of an accounting of the major steps in your research Okay, let's get into some ultra specific information here with the design number one, right? Pretest, post test uh, for the procedures. If you, if in the back of your mind you've already chosen the fact that you want to do a time series and you're, you are, <clears throat> excuse me, you're, you're set on it. Go ahead and feel free to skip the next, uh, the next couple slides. If you're still not sure, which will be the vast majority, of you are still not, not entirely sure which design you want to go with. Um, Go ahead and listen to both of them. I think to some degree it will, it will clarify or it will solidify uh, your ideas as to which path you want your research to take. So for now, next two slides, let's look at design number one, procedures. Let's start off with your control procedures because typically those would come first in your, in your research sequence. And with your control procedures, what you need to what you need to highlight is what your what your typical everyday lessons might look like in your in your particular classroom as it relates to your to your research let me give you let me give you a practical example <clears throat> let's say now the intervention that you're eventually proposing is going to take place within the content area of science right you have uh, you have your 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 science periods and you want to you want to come up with a, an intervention to help uh, to help uh, children grow in, in that uh, in that particular domain, the intervention or the eventual intervention has to be compared to something, right? In this case, it's going to be compared to your your control group. Your control group lessons are the routines, the academic processes, the lesson analysis, the content that you would typically find in your everyday science lesson or social studies or ELA or math or whatever area that you're going to be looking at. That those control procedures are going to provide that baseline that we need to understand. Look, this is how we typically do it, but with the intervention, this is how we're going to do it now. Oh, you know what? I see the difference. I see the difference between the two. Of course, your measurement tools, which we'll talk about in a little while, are going to tell you which one is more effective, what you do on an everyday basis or your intervention. But we'll get to that eventually. For now, start thinking about some of those writing points that you could bring into your control procedures in order to help the reader fully understand the way that it's typically done, the control procedures. Let's look at the intervention procedures. Great, you were able to identify those control procedures. Now let's move on to your intervention. Everyone in the class is proposing one, right? We're all proposing in a, a, a type of intervention that's going to help uh, solve some sort of problem. That, that's your problem, that, that's done from your problem statement. As you begin to write your, your intervention procedures, you're going to go through that process again of highlighting the, those those steps that deviate from the from the control group. You don't necessarily want to repeat the information from the control group. Instead, you want to write about those new lessons, those new strategies, uh, how the 
independent variable, how the IV is going to be expressed in your research time. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at your hypotheses, you see your IV there. Well, how is that going to look like in your, how is that going to look like in your, in your writing? How's that going to look like in your, in your classrooms? If you look at the very, very bottom, you don't have a lot of room to accomplish this for the control and for the intervention. Excuse me, one minute, sorry. <clears throat> you don't have a lot of a lot of real estate uh, of which to uh, in which to write. Now, obviously, like always, the page numbers are, are just suggestions. They're they're probably the the minimum amount of uh, of of writing that needs to be in needs to go into it in order to say what it needs to say. Uh, in this case, it's uh, about one page each. One page for your control procedures, one page for your intervention procedures. Once you're able to do that, you should be able to read it, or I should be able to read it. Anybody should be able to read it and say, okay, I see what she's doing. I see what she's doing on an everyday basis in her science lessons. Again, just an example. Um, I see now the intervention that's being that's that is being proposed that, that she's going to deliver it. Great. Now we're ready to move on to find out how you know which one was a more more effective way of uh, of doing it. Um, that is it as far as design number one. We're going to move on to correlational, so it's going to look just a little different. This information, as far as the procedures, is going to apply <clears throat> not only to the time series, but also the correlational, meaning design number two and design number three. So it's nice because the, the time series procedures are actually just on this one slide. They're, 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 they're not, that, they're not that, that difficult in the sense that your writing is probably going to remain fairly fairly similar. But there's one major difference, and that's bullet point number one there. If you think back to the way that a time series or a correlational uh, series would, would look like, there is no control group. So that comparative group that you would have in your, your pretest, post-test, design number one, that comparative group is not the control group. That comparative group are the different trials that will take place over and over and over again. I had suggested four trials for four weeks. That's what you're, that's what you're comparing. So because that control group doesn't exist, what you're essentially doing with your procedures is you're discussing them individually on a, uh, on a trial, by, trial by trial basis. There will be slight variations between the, the different trials and as you as you seek to fill in the, the details that are needed, you're going to mention some of those variations. But on the same hand, you know, for the most part, each trial is going to remain fairly, fairly consistent. So you do want to keep that redundancy to, to a minimum and not say the same things over, over and over again. I mean, inevitably, there will be some some repeated information as you go through through each individual trial. Um, so don't worry too much about that. But kind of keep that kind of keep that in the back of your mind that that you're just basically just describing the the different trials and um, and and how and how that looks like over the course of a month. Uh, I don't have a page number at the bottom, uh, but if you if you if you really put me in a spot, I would turn around and say that the the time series procedures is about a, maybe about a page, maybe a page and a half if you want to stretch it just a little bit. So. The control intervention uh, design number one is going to be about two pages. So it's going to be a little bit longer because you have that control uh, sequence that you need to also uh, fill in. But if you've chosen the time series, you've you've earned yourself half a page. So um, whichever one you choose is is obviously is obviously going to be entirely up to you. Uh, but this one will look just a little bit differently. I have one more thing to mention here before we uh, transition. So this slide is actually kind of important, not just for the time series, but also for for control intervention design number one. Uh, as you write your procedures, right? You're writing them out. 
you're going to mention the tools as they come in a chronological order. Think back to the calendar. Maybe I'll even, I'll even include the calendar again later on. So think back to the calendar and how those tasks all fill into, into particular days. So you're going to mention uh, a tool. For example, day number one, you know, you, as you're writing, uh, you, my research, research will begin with, with a pretest on, on, Monday, on Monday morning during second period science class, what have you. You'll notice that I mentioned the test, right? I mentioned that it's, that it's a pretest. I mentioned that, that it could be a, a teacher-made test. However, don't get into the details of those tools within your procedures. Let me say that one more time. You're going to mention the tools as part of your procedure. Right? They happen in a chronological order, so they're going to get thrown in there. But you're not going to necessarily discuss the details of, of what those tools are. That's because the, that section will come later on. If you start adding the details in your procedure, essentially you're going to start bogging it down. You know, It's going to get very, very thick and, and lethargic, and it's going to be hard to separate as a reader. It's going to be hard to separate the difference between what is procedure and what is tool. So let's just separate them and kind of, you know, break them off and, and, and give them their own, their own little bit of real estate and highlight each one of those. Mention in the procedures, don't discuss the details, and let's take a look at what that might look like uh, as far as tools later on. Whoop. Quick slide here, quick slide. Uh, just some, some guiding questions, some, some questions that might kind of help you. Uh, I'm not going to spend any more time on this. I'll have you, you know, when, when you are ready to write, uh, if you do need the support of this slide, uh, to some degree, as you answer the questions, you also hopefully will gain some ideas of, of, how, to, um, of how to write your, your procedures. For the, for the majority of you, you won't even need this. Uh, but if you do, it's here for you and waiting as a resource. Subheading three through six, um, we're going to talk about the instruments here. Uh, by the way, don't, don't get jammed up too much with, uh, with the number of the, of the subheadings. So let's say, for example, uh, I don't know, in, in, your, in your procedural writing, you, you've added another subheading and now, you know, your instruments are going to be four through seven, right? You need four, you need four little subheadings for, for each instrument, four instruments, four subheadings. Um, if you... If you find that, that, that the number of subheadings don't necessarily match up and you're going over a little bit, uh, definitely not, not the end of the world. I don't think you would have less subheadings than I have proposed here, uh, but if you have a, a few more, it's, uh, it's definitely not the end of the world. As long as it's clear for, for me to, to read, understand, and grade, uh, that, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Uh, so back to these, uh, back to these instruments. We had said on the last slide that you are you are not going to go into great detail in your in your in your procedures as far as your instruments. That's because here you are going to go into into that needed uh, into that needed detail, and you have four you have four dependent variables, right? Four measurement in, four measurement tools. You're going to write about each one of these as part of their own subheading. If you look at the very very bottom before anybody freaks out. It's only about one to two paragraphs per per tool, so the entire the entire the entirety of this particular section, the methodologies, won't really won't be that long, and we'll get to, we'll get into some totals in a second. But for now, uh, you are certainly going to discuss a lot of those finer details that are that are going to be in your in your tools. Let me give you some some examples, right? Uh, if you have, let's say, a teacher made test. And your your teacher made test is going to serve as as a as a particular tool. You're now going to discuss the type of content, the format, the the length, how long it should take, uh, maybe some of the rationale that you had for for using this particular this particular content. Uh, that's the type of writing that's going to go into the, those one to two paragraphs. If you're using a survey. Uh, Perhaps you can give a, an example of a question or two that would also apply for the qualitative side. The, uh, the interview may, may have some sample, some sample questions. The, the questionnaire may have some sample questions there. It's, I'll be honest, a paragraph or, or, paragraph or, or like two paragraphs, two small paragraphs, 
uh, you'll fill them up. You'll fill them up right away because essentially you're just describing you're just describing the tool in its uh, in its entirety in its in its totality. Like the last like the last guiding question page, uh, I'm not going to get into this uh, all that all that much. If you do need some support, if you do need some support uh, uh, during your during your writing during when you're actually putting pen to paper. Uh, these questions are there for you. If you're able to kind of answer them, you know, if you're, especially if you're stuck, uh, this would be a great resource to kind of like, uh, you know, gain some traction. And as you answer the questions, you're also obviously writing uh, through that. Uh, these uh, guiding questions could also serve as kind of like a quasi try it now, uh, meaning that if you do need to communicate with me and uh, you do have questions about how this is going to look, some of these questions might actually serve as a platform between uh, between you and I. Uh, so take a look when 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 you have a chance and if you need it. I feel like I said like a whole bunch in the past. I don't know. I guess eight, nine, ten minutes or so. So what I decided to do was uh, put everything on a put all the subheadings on a single slide. If you look to the left, you have your, your pretest design, right? We said that, that it was going to look differently than the series. So the subheading is going to be introduction, the control procedures, experimental procedures, and then you're gonna have four subheadings for your, for your measurement tools, two qualitative, two quantitative. Obviously, if you want more, more information about each one of those, hit re the rewind button and go back to what I just said over the past 10 minutes. If you're, <clears throat> if you're not doing the pretest, post test, and you're doing the time series, either correlational or the simple time series, still going to start with that introduction. That's not going to change. Uh, what is going to change is that trial by trial uh, procedures, uh, that process, which is going to be different than the control. Remember, trial by trial does not have a control. Uh, and then the measurement tools are certainly going to uh, live there as well, and you still have your, your four subheadings for that. Kind of what it looks like, kind of what it looks like on a slide. This will give us a total of, yeah, three to four pages. Not too bad. Whole section, three to four pages. It's a, it's a short one, guys. It's a short one. It's, it's, it's for you to get the information out. It's for me to be able to, to assess your ideas before you actually get started with your with your research. In, a, in some ways, these three to four pages are going to be a, a safety net for, for everyone involved. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's all I have to say about that uh, that process. I'm at, I'm at about an hour and 10 minutes, so I'm going to begin to to wrap this up here shortly. Not just one, but multiple slides of clarity. Ooh, dun, dun, dun. So we'll start this first slide of clarity by taking a look at that due date for section number two, which is going to be on 1019. Uh, if all goes according to plan, you should have at least 10 days to, to get that done. And remember, it is not a lot of writing, but it is going to require a little bit of thought and care into the way that you want your research to unfold and happen for you. Um, as a little tidbit, that second bullet point, remember to use section one to guide your section two. Now, that may seem obvious at, at face value when, when I say it, but a lot of times section one becomes almost like an independent paper and gets uh, put in a, in a drive somewhere out in the, in the great vast internet. Take it out, have it open, let it let it guide section two. Remember, uh, whatever you have in section one is going to be the fundamental and the the fundamental building blocks and the basis for your for your section two. So definitely definitely have that definitely have that in mind. Um, right now, as of now, uh, you you have all the information that you need in order to write section number two, including the format. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and get and get started on that. Uh, for those of you that were able to hand in your section one a little bit early, you know the advantage and the feeling of, of getting your work done ahead of time and um, taking advantage of that. 
I was going to have a second slide of clarity, but I, I kind of changed my mind as I was uh, as I was re reviewing the past couple slides leading up to up to this one. Um, what I was going to do here was I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the steps that you may or may not want to take before actually delivering your intervention to your class. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to either create a supplemental video or maybe it's something that I could address. Maybe it's something that I could address during a, a live meet in the next uh, in the next week or so. But either way, uh, I'll leave this slide uh, blank for now. And instead of giving you more more clarity, I will say, have a great and wonderful week. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you back in lecture number six.